All right, folks. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about half wave uh, dipole antennas. And uh, the reason is, is that I get a lot of questions. Uh, people say, hey, hey, what is the best antenna that I can buy? What is the best antenna for ham radio? And uh, that's a trickier or complicated question. Uh, that's very difficult to answer. Uh, and so when I talk to people, it really turns out that maybe they're looking just to get into ham radio. They're looking to play around a particular band or frequency. And uh, a really easy and expensive way to do that is to either build or even buy a half wavelength dipole antenna. Um, you'll learn a lot about uh, antennas in general, about mounting antennas, hanging antennas, uh, tuning antennas, matching antennas, um, and, and, and working with things like SWR. So uh, what I wanted to do today is kind of an intro or basic video on an entry level type antenna like a dipole. And in particular, we're going to take a look at the half wavelength dipole. Uh, if you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up or leave a comment below. It really helps the algorithm and uh, helps other people find the content. I'd love to hear any uh, any questions or feedback that you have, constructive criticism about anything that we cover in the video. Uh, go ahead and post that below. And then, uh, as always, subscribe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so we're just going to start off by asking the question, what is a half-wave dipole antenna? Um, and the answer is it's a simple antenna that is very common. A half wavelength of a desired frequency is the length or, or the overall size of the antenna. Now, a half wavelength dipole is resonant on a single frequency. It can only be resonant on a single frequency. Now, you'll hear people say, oh, I cut my dipole or I bought a dipole for the 20 meter band or for the 10 meter band. Well, that means that the frequency that it is resonant on is within that band and it's close to resonant on most of, if not all of that band. But it can only be truly resonant on a single frequency. And then you compromise as you move across a spectrum of frequencies. A half wavelength dipole has two equal radiating elements. Uh, each is a quarter of a wavelength in length. Um, now an example would be a dipole for 20 meters is 10 meters in length with two five meter elements. Seems pretty simple, right? Uh, here you can see a couple of examples of half wavelength dipoles. Um, it's essentially two wires connected to a center or feed point, and then typically you secure the end with um, insulators. And in this case, these are sometimes referred to as dog bone insulators. I did want to note um, at your uh, feed point, many people will use a choke to reduce uh, RFI or radio frequency interference from coming back on your transmission line impacting uh, the quality of your signal and potentially introducing RFI into your ham shack and uh, messing with your radio. Um, many people will refer to this choke as a ballon. Uh, sometimes they'll call it a one-to-one -one ballon uh, and that is just the way it is. They use different names for different things but the appropriate term is a choke because you're choking out the RFI. I want to talk a few minutes about the types of dipole antennas. Uh, here are some diagrams that I put together of different types. But uh, some of the more common ones you'll see are a flat top, an inverted V, and a sloper. Those three are uh, depicted here and should be pretty easy to detect. Um, basically your radials are a quarter of a wavelength long. They attach to a center connector or feed point. Uh, that's where your feed line comes in and the feed line goes back to your radio or to a tuner or an ATU at the radio. There are some things uh, such as multiband dipoles like a loaded dipole or a fan dipole. We'll take a look at some diagrams of them. And there are a lot of other types of dipoles, uh, half wavelength dipoles that we're not going to discuss. There are many, many types of dipoles and you are really only limited to your imagination or the imagination of other antenna designers. So in terms of multi-banded dipoles, I did want to mention the loaded dipole and the fan dipole. So on the left, we have an example of a loaded dipole. And what that would use are um, inductance, coils, inductance coils or potentially traps that electrically uh, lengthen or shorten the radials on your dipole. And uh, when this happens, 
your dipole can be resonant on more than one frequency um, or it can work on more than one band potentially. Um, and you do this by adding or removing reactants uh, to your antenna. The, uh, on the right, what we have there is what's called a fan dipole. And that's when you add more than one set of radiating elements to your, uh, your feed point. So in this example, you could have two elements that are uh, on a 30 meter band and then two of them that are on a 20 meter band, for example. Or you could have 40 and 30 or uh, any, any combination. And some people will actually add more than uh, what we have here. So you'll see a fan dipole that can operate on, let's just say, 80, 60, 40, and 30. Okay, so we're looking at some antenna modeling software, and we're using a product called MMANA-GAL. Let me go ahead and open up a file. It comes with uh, some sample antennas in here that you can play around with and uh, test out and try out. And this is just a 20 meter dipole. And the first thing I wanna do is take a look, and here is an X, Y, and Z um, axis where I can see the antenna here. And that is uh, set up to radiate in free space. So if you look here underground, it's set up for free space. So what I wanna do is I just wanna start the calculation on this antenna. <clears throat> and it comes back with the data set. And here you can see the SWR is set at uh, um, 1.43 to one. So if I go over here to far field plots, I can see a radiation pattern. In this example, the antenna is running east to west right here, or maybe west to east, I'm not sure, depending upon your orientation. And uh, you can see these two lobes, and what that shows is the gain or the radiation pattern. So to the north and to the south, this antenna is going to have the most gain and work the best. To the east and west, you do not see the lobes, and as a result, you have less gain and the antenna won't, won't work as well um, in that direction. Now I want to take a quick look at uh, the 3D um, <clears throat> representation of this. So here you can see the radiation pattern. and I, I can turn this and it looks basically like a donut, but here it is oriented uh, <clears throat> up and down. And because this is in free space, <clears throat> there is no effects of the ground. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was the effects of antenna height and ground systems and how that affects your radiation pattern. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So in order to do that, the first thing we're going to do is come back over here to calculate and then we're going to pick real ground and we are going to start the calculation again and we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at our far field plots. And as you can see, the pattern has changed. It's less dramatic on the east to west going down into the lower uh, lower gain area and then here you can see the radiation pattern has developed some lobes. So let's take a look at those lobes in 3D. And then you can see that this is because the antenna is now not in free space like an isotropic radiator it is 20 meters above the ground. Now let's go back over to calculate and I did want to take a look at this plot. And when you do this, I can come over here and take a look at SWR, and we will look at resonance. And then you can see that the antenna is most resonant down here at uh, 14.15 megahertz. Uh, here you can see it at what the antenna was designed to be at at 14.05. <clears throat> and our SWR is under 1 to 7, and it's lower, it's below 1 to 6 here. One of the things I wanted to do is show the effects of height. So here we're at 20 meters. Let's go and drop it down to 10 meters. Start the calculation, and then let's go back to far field plots. Now here you can see that the lobe has changed, and then you can actually use this tool to measure your gain at different elevations. Now let's take a look at our 3D field here. And so you can see how it changes the radiation pattern that we talked about. And let's go back over here to calculate and take a look at our plots. And then take a look at our SWR and our resonance. And as you can see, the SWR and the resonance, resonance has changed based off of the height of that particular antenna. Okay, let's go back to the slide deck. 
So I wanted to take a minute to talk about the different types of materials that folks use when they build um, these dipole antennas. Now this is whether you build it yourself or whether you buy it. Um, the elements are typically made um, from wire or from rods. I think wire is probably the most common thing that you're going to see. Um, and in terms of wire, you know, the general stuff, you might see copper, aluminum, or steel. In some cases, you may see copper clad aluminum. Uh, what I typically do when I build a dipole is I use uh, copper clad aluminum. And uh, I typically will look for something like an 18 to 22, somewhere right around their gauge wire. Um, now, the thicker your wire is up until a point, the more broad banded or the, the more near resonant it is across a larger spectrum of frequencies. Now in terms of feed line, uh, you typically see a coaxial cable, window line, or ladder line. To many people, window line and ladder line are the same thing. To other people, they're different. In this example here in the picture, what I have is some stripped coax cable that is ready for termination. Um, you can see the, the, uh, the center, the, the center element the insulation and then the uh, the outer webbing and then on the feed line uh, for the for the below that it's what I would call window line some people again may call it ladder line but there you have two equal uh, wires that run uh, next to each other all right well you might be asking yourself well, what is SWR you know I hear it mentioned uh, all the time and I hear it mentioned in this video and it's uh, a standing wave ratio, uh, which is an impedance measurement that is shown in ohms comparing a load, in our case an antenna, to a transmission line. Um, in our case, it would be a coaxial cable. And what you do is, is that you come up with a ratio for your forward versus your reflected power. Now, when um, you have a mismatch, uh, say you have high impedance on your antenna and then your, your transmission line is 50, what will happen is, is that power, instead of being radiated out of your antenna, is reflected back on your transmission line and introduces uh, um, loss on your transmission line and it can also come back into your ham shack and, play, and wreak havoc on your radio. Some folks will measure uh, your SWR um, at the antenna and where it feeds into the feed line. And that will truly give you the best measurement of what is being reflected in and out of your antenna system. Now, what I do is I, I measure mine at the radio versus the antenna system. The antenna system includes my feed line. So uh, it's easy to do it that way. And it also lets me know what SWR is being experienced by my radio. Now, the, the big reason for the difference is, is that your feed line can introduce what's called line loss into your antenna system. So I may be uh, transmitting at 50 watts from my radio, but only 30 watts of that are getting to my antenna. And now a portion of that is being reflected back into my transmission line. And as it comes back to my radio, more line loss is introduced. And so I don't really have an accurate SWR for my antenna at the feed point, but I do with the radio system. It's just a matter of what you prefer. Um, there isn't really a better or worse way to do that. Some people put their antenna tuners at the radio. Some people put their antenna tuners um, out at the antenna. Uh, I did want to note that reflected power can damage your radio, impact the quality of your, the signal that you're producing. And I like to try to keep my SWR below 1.5 to 1. Now that uh, might be controversial. Some people want it lower. Some people say it's safe to go higher. It's really up to you and what you decide. So I did want to talk a little bit about antenna matching. Uh, this is another uh, hot, hot button issue. Um, some people will call it tuning an antenna, and you really can only tune an antenna by mechanically altering your antenna in some way, whether that's lengthening radials, shortening radials, um, uh, uh, making your, your antenna higher or lower, uh, adding grounding to it. There, there's, there's many ways to do that. Um, but you'll hear people use what's called an ATU or an antenna tuner. So your modern radios are um, really designed with the 50 ohm output impedance. Now your antennas and your antenna systems can have very low impedance or very high impedance. Um, half wave antennas, and the reason I recommend people usually start with or play around with the half wavelength antennas are simple, um, but they're resonant to a particular frequency and then as a result they should have a 50 ohm impedance 
provided that they're mounted at the correct height um, and, and set up correctly. Uh, resonant half-wave dipoles shouldn't require matching. They, they should be uh, right at that 1.5 to lower um, SWR ratio. Now what an antenna tuner does is it does not tune your antenna. It tricks the radio by um, either adding or removing inductive or capacitive reactants to your antenna system. They also introduce line laws. So your antenna is not going to perform any better. It's just that your radio will not uh, have problems because of reflected power coming back into the radio that could cause problems with your finals or, or, or your radio in general. Many uh, modern radios do come with limited ATUs that can handle SWRs up to 3 to 1, but uh, in many cases you'll see much, much higher um, SWR ratios depending upon the type of antenna and how you have it mounted. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you calculate the size of your antenna, and this is if you're building your own antenna or maybe tuning an antenna that was given to you or, or you bought. And this looks scary because there's letters, and uh, I don't like letters in my math because I'm a bad speller. But there's really only three things that we really concern ourselves with, and it's frequency, and that's the frequency that we want the dipole to be resonant at. Uh, we have the length of the antenna represented by L, and that's the total length, and then the element length represented by E, which is the length of each radial or element. So there's two formulas. The first formula for calculating the length of your antenna is 468 divided by the frequency. Now we want to take the length of that antenna divided by 2, so we get our element length by taking the length and dividing by 2. Simple, right? So in this example, we take uh, 468, we divide that by 14.2 megahertz, and that gives us a length of 32.957 feet. Now, in order to figure out how I want to cut my elements, I would take 32.957, divide that by 2, and I'm targeting 16.478 feet. Now, I would probably cut those radials a little bit long because I can trim them back uh, as I go through a tuning process. So when you uh, buy a dipole or you build a dipole, there's some useful tools that I wanted to, to point out. The first is a dipole calculator, and uh, the one that I use is West Mountain Radio, and it takes that formula and throws it out the window. You don't need it. So you just type in the frequency in the calculator, you hit the calculate button, and it gives you the overall length and the element length of your antenna. So it's pretty simple, but it's nice to know how that, that is calculated in the event that you have to do it by hand. The other thing is, is that you probably want to look at an antenna analyzer at some point in time. Even if you're not building your antennas, you're buying your antennas, you can see from the modeling software exercise that we did earlier in the video that even adjusting the height, the height of your antenna can greatly uh, impact its performance. The one on the left is, uh, left is a rig expert. They're, they're very nice, feature rich, and expensive. Um, then there's a nano VNA depicted here. That's what I use. I got mine uh, on eBay for about $50. They're a little bit more difficult to use. Um, they're complex <laughs> and uh, they're difficult to calibrate, but uh, they work and if you buy one, you'll learn a thing or two. Anyhow, that's it. If you have any questions, you can post them below and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, any kind of feedback or constructive criticism, I'd love to hear it, so go ahead and post that below. If you like the video, go ahead and click the thumbs up, share, subscribe. You know, you know the drill. Thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it.